when you put on your kind of parkour kind of like vision, suddenly everything is applicable to you and everything is you can interact with, whether that's in nature or with an urban environment. And one of the crazy things about it as well was the fact that you could train at a spot that seems pretty basic, but seven, eight years later, you're still finding new stuff. So there's this really weird depth about it as well, where you can be in the same environment, but like internally, your internal landscape is evolving and forming as well. And then you're interacting with the physical environment and coming up with new things. And that, that in itself is really, really satisfying. Hey guys, before we get to this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about an exciting development at Evolve Move Play. So we are bringing back our two-day traveling workshops. So that means one of our workshops might be coming out to a city near you, or potentially you could reach out to us and bring us to a city near you. We did this for years. I started When I started Evolve Move Play, I taught traveling workshops all over the world from 2013 to 2019. But after the birth of my youngest daughter, I needed to stay home more with my wife and my three kids. And so we stopped those. But now we have a really amazing staff of teachers who've come up with me through the retreats of the last few years. And I myself have a little bit more freedom to travel. So we've got four upcoming dates here in the States and two dates in Europe coming up where you can come and train with us for just two days. That means it's going to be a lot easier entry point as far as cost and logistics for you to come and join us. So check out what's going on with our two-day workshops in the link down below. And we look forward to seeing you in a city near you soon. Julian, welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. Um, you know, as we were just talking about, you and I have kind of known of each other for many years, but you're kind of one of the granddaddies of the whole UK parkour scene. Um, oh, dear. That would be... <laughs> That's quite a setup. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Now... People won't necessarily know your name anymore because you. How long have you kind of been stepped away from the parkour community? Oh dear, yeah. I think. Um, it's, oh, let me have a think. So probably, probably not training sincerely in parkour since around twenty thirteen, something like that. Like so, decade. man, like a decade, yeah. Yeah. But I, I think since there were a few years where I was still kind of dabbling in it and doing mainly doing it by myself to be honest um not participating in big groups and things um but to be honest a lot of it was just because of injuries and things and then getting sidetracked down different pursuits physical pursuits um but i, I think i was on and off and then haven't really done it for the past you know four years maybe so like no park for about four years yeah about that four years yeah. So I, I thought it'd be interesting to have a chat with you because I really admired the the early stuff that you did with the Cambridge Tracers and kind of the influence that you had on that on the community. And I think it's interesting to hear the stories of people who have uh who've gone, you know, and done other things with their lives and kind of what their experience of parkour was and how it impacted them. And you also have a lot of insight into the world that like how parkour became what it is and how it's changed over the years. And my particular interest on this is really on the philosophical side of parkour, which I think is something that um, that was a lot more important, actually, early on in some ways. <laughs> and it is in many ways forgotten. And I think, uh, yeah, you might have some insight into that. And then I think even your career choice, I'm curious if that was influenced by the philosophy of parkour. Mm, so, yeah. Um, that's kind of where I want to go. Um, cool. So let's... Uh, Let's start with that. Like, how did, how, what was important to you about parkour when you found it? You were in your mid teens when you discovered parkour? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was 16 and it was 2003. Um, and basically, it was Jump London, the first airing of Jump London. And there's progressively less people that I know who started parkour because of Jump London. It's, yeah. uh, I don't know if actually kind of, newer practitioners even know about it i'm not too sure but it was the thing that really yeah it was it was really the thing that brought parkour from france and exported it out of france um and so i saw it i saw like an advert for it on the tv and i remember just walking into my living room and seeing some i didn't even i couldn't even tell what it was if i'm honest it was like i had some shadows going across this across the screen and a couple of really cool jumps and it just absolutely like fixated me um, and I made a note of when it was going to air, 
and put it in my diary, which is like the most organized I'd ever been up until that point. And then sat down and watched it. And it was Sebastian Foucault, uh, Jerome, um, and it was Johan Vigoro as well, the three main guys who were, you know, like the founders really off par with the Yamakaze and David Bell and everybody else. And so I, th- I think there's, I think in your life, there's often you can identify like things that are counted on what, like one hand that kind of really smack in the face and resonate very strongly with you. And seeing that documentary did that to me because I just couldn't figure out what it was. It seemed like something where there was no rules and so much freedom. Um, and at the time, I think being a 16 year old, like teenager, things like ninjas and SWAT teams and all that kind of stuff was like the coolest thing I could ever think of. And it had a lot of elements of that as well. And they often spoke about Dragon Ball Z, Bruce Lee. There were so many, the Venn diagram of all the different disciplines that crossed over with parkour was was all really exciting for me. So um, yeah, I kind of started off that. And the first thing that I said that day, my dad had a treadmill in the garage and I was like, right, I'm, I'm going to go and do a run. So like I got on the treadmill and I, I tried to run one mile. I can't even remember if I need it. Uh, and I was like, right, I've, I've started now. This is the beginning. Uh, and then it was just a case of kind of going to schools and going on roofs of schools and spending loads of time trying to jump on and off picnic benches for months <laughs> on end. <laughs> and remember, uh, I, of calling the picnic bench, that was, that <laughs> yeah. was real. Then it was like an initiation. Yeah, and if you did it lengthways, it was like whoa. <laughs> yeah, never mind widthways. So yeah, that was kind of um. So it's weird. I don't know. I th- I think you often don't know why you like things. They just sort of call out to you. Um, and sometimes when when you try and describe why you like a thing, if you if someone asks you, oh, why do you like your wife? It's like. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of. I think it's kind of difficult to. Yeah, and um, I'm not saying Barker was like, <laughs> like my wife, but just it's it's difficult to say why I was so attracted to it. Um, but I just was, and and obviously there was a small contingent of people that eventually did grow who were attracted to it in the UK at least. Gosh, I um, so I was already teach. I'd already been doing martial arts since I was like six years old. I was going to say, man, how about you? Yeah. yeah. Six years old was when I started martial arts, and I had had a big transformative experience in martial arts. And then I got into gymnastics after the 1996 Olympics. Um, and then I kind of did that off and on. So I, was, I had become a teacher of gymnastics. And then I saw mm-hmm. the on avance du jour is at VU. Right? Uh, mm-hmm. And that was the one that sparked it. My older brother actually showed it to me. Is that the one where David Bell is... Uh... Just looking really bad at his got his kind of Asian music in the background and he's it starts in the like, dark and you can see his back. Right. Yeah. It's, oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah no. He's actually in the gym. That's right. So he's like doing acrobatics and he's doing martial arts yeah, tricks. Right. For real. And then then it cuts to an so actually reused footage from Speed Airman. But uh that's right. That was that's real great. for me, man. And food's interesting because I started I standing on rails in between classes. Uh, just like bouncing on rails in between classes. Um, but I had a, a buddy who we weren't even really friends at that point. We just knew each other through the, uh, the uh, adult open, the adult gymnastics classes. And he was already doing mm-hmm. parkour like stuff. So I told him about it and he, um, he went and looked at the videos and then went to the office and grabbed my number and called me and told me to come out and do stuff with him. And he actually already had climbs and jumps and routes all around the city. Ideal. <laughs> that was really one of those barrels. So it was like you know, your uh, you know the Danny Yellow Bottom, yeah. particular era. Uh, there, <laughs> she could take me out and chill. Yeah, yeah. that's great to have a bit of a template because that was the that was a weird thing. Just not having uh, having videos like yeah. that, um, Speed Air Man and things. You're looking at it thinking, what the hell? You, you couldn't fathom how that was done. And then the gap between <laughs> where I was then and that was like. Yeah, an unimaginably big chasm that you didn't really know how to cross. So that's great that you had someone. Yeah, there's a bit more. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think it's very interesting. It's kind of like an under 
like nobody really talks about this phenomenon that there were like people who kind of did parkour they never stopped doing parkour as kids mm -hmm. you were just sort of around because my understanding is like danny uh, danny didn't uh, yeah, start yeah. doing parkour because of parkour he started doing parkour no. weirdly because of capoeira yeah i think his his whole thing was he saw he saw a guy in the streets around his neighborhood do i think it was a wall flip yeah i think but it was definitely one type of like aerial flip and then he was like oh i'm gonna do that and then uh, yeah as you say he started doing capoeira and stuff and just because the first time I saw Danny's videos, it was his level was yeah, it was just so far advanced, and nobody could really figure out why. Because everyone else had only just found out about this thing called parkour. But it was just doing, he was just doing it anyway, which was just insane. Yeah, um, yeah. And there were a few people like that actually. I remember in Cambridge there was another guy um, who, because <laughs> everyone needed a street name. His name name was Nemo before the movie. Uh, and again, this was one of those just hyper athletic kids had never done um, gymnastics or, uh, as far as I know, any athletic background, but was doing backflips off telephone boxes, wall flips, and would just just learn stuff on concrete. Um, and and there were a few of these weird characters knocking about. Yeah, um, yeah, it was crazy. But being like a normal human, that that did not come easily to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that I've heard the same sort of story about Oleg Vorslav, that like, mm, yeah, yeah, the community found him in that playground, right? <laughs> they all started doing parkour, and then they found this freak doing his thing in the playground who was better than any of them would ever be. <laughs> I'm doing, just like doing it for the sake of doing it, not even any ulterior motives. I'm just going to do this. It's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> so I think that I, I actually asked Sebastian about that, about like, Let's say like every kid starts doing parkour. Mm -hmm. Some some people just never give it up. But why was it that that group was able to take it from from being a thing that these weird feral people do? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Whole community organizes around that could then be named and picked up by kids all around the world. I think that's just mm -hmm. something fascinating, kind of anthropological question. Like my theory is that it has to do with the way that um that they were all like kind of from from minority backgrounds living in the Bamas of Paris, right? Uh but Seb Seb doesn't like that theory. So um Oh really? I know that um it I, I think David's father had like a really he must have had a really big driving force as well because I think there was I mean you, you never really know these things, but reading and hearing from other people it seemed like he was what at least they were trying to emulate and so there was this kind of north star that seemed to carry him forwards and then other people yeah i guess gravitated around david in a similar way so um and, and then trying to express all of the skills that he's learning through parkour in a practical way by joining the fire brigade in the military and all those kinds of things um yeah it it's, it is a weird one though um how it how it did get exported because there must be a lot of kind of fledgling movements and things that just die out you think about uh dogtown and z boys who started kind of skateboarding after not being able to surf and they were just some dudes attaching wheels to their surfboards and that could have just been like what are we doing but yeah yeah that's another thing that just now look at skateboarding so it is odd the kind of conspiracy of uh, events that lead to something like that quite a countercultural movement springing up it's yeah. cool it's an interesting question I mean, you guys, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, wasn't there like a buildering movement in Cambridge that predated the parkour movement? Yeah, there was. There was. Yeah, the came. I think they were just called the Cambridge Climbers. I'm good. My memory is going to be a bit hazy, but there, there is a book that has been published. Mm -hmm. And it was in, these guys were, yeah, a lot of them were in academia at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And I believe some of them were, kind of not within that field as in that realm as well but it was around kind of i want to say certainly the early mid 1900s that sort of time and there's some really cool photographs of people up on iconic areas around the cambridge colleges doing like i remember there's a roof gap that we used to look at and then we, we found this photograph of a guy doing it in like 1910 or something ridiculous black and white and then it just made you made you think okay there's there's a lot of things that just aren't that new actually it's it's how things are packaged and and 
spread and and sort of communicated that it's the new thing, but some of these things have been done for a long time. So it was cool to see that tradition in Cambridge yeah. when we were there. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating thing. Um, let's let's talk a little bit more about your background. So you, you know, when I found your work, you were or found your your training, you were really attached to kind of like to uh, to Owen Coville, right? It was Jin and Owen and the, the just like that. Very serious. <laughs> Um, yeah, which seems like a team name, but it, it was always just a few of first I could tell. It's just, just uh, yeah, yeah, my nickname and his real name, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so you guys kind of like, how did you meet Owen? Did you know him before you started parkour? Or? No, it was one of these uh friendships that you get from parkour. Um, I didn't know him at all actually. So he he lives in Cambridge as well, he lived in Cambridge. Um, and I think. We met through a guy who was already doing a bit of parkour a bit earlier than us, um, but stopped very soon after we met, basically. Um, and I think there was a bit of urban free flow forums facilitating this as well. And um, yeah, we just we just hit it off, man. Like uh, we we spent a lot of time training together. We were at different schools, different um, I guess what would you call them, high schools at the time, sixth form colleges. Um, but one guy who w- will hate the fact that I mention it, but he needs a mention because he's a bit of a, he's an unknown character in Cambridge parkour's development. There's a guy called Christoph, um, which is, I mean, whether that's his real name or not is another thing, but it, it was this German guy who at the time, so me and Owen were, I think, 16 years old. He came over from Germany at the age of 17 um to participate in like english language learning and he had been training with i think at the time he'd already trained with people like joe ego um he'd trained with some of the french practitioners as well yeah. um, i don't think kind of the original guys but you know he, he basically came over with this air of mystique about him um so we trained with him a lot and he he's he's really the genesis of things like landing silently what we what we tried to coin the cambridge stealth landing okay. <laughs> we were like we need a name for this move and um he he's got a, he had a background in wushu martial arts uh, he studied with um, different martial arts practitioners and things and so he brought all of this to to the cambridge scene and we spent a lot of time with him um and and i think so much of cambridge parkour has to be credited to him because he 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 did just kind of takes under his wing and said you know you need to land quietly in order to protect your joints um you need to move through your environment without disturbing it and without um leaving a trace sort of thing and and all the different associated tenants that kind of spread through parkour um not just as a result of him or cambridge but just more generally he was bringing up already all the way back then so so yeah we um he, he was only around for a year but then after that me and owen just yeah trained together a lot um and traveled around met jason matten um and a lot of the other guys around london and that kind of surrounding area um and of course phil doyle came in when he was like 30 um how old were you uh, oh i think i need to try and remember now I think I was around. I think I was around seventeen, eighteen. Okay, so yeah. something like that. Yeah, he's yeah around around seventeen, eighteen years old. Five years. Um, old. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, pretty much four or five years older. Yeah, um, and it was Jason who he met Jason Matten in France and saw Jason doing a front flip, like a diving front flip, at the beach onto the sand and he went up to him and he was like whoa what are you doing and jason kind of played with him you know did some parkour and some teaching and stuff and then asked where are you from phil said oh, i'm from cambridge and he said oh right okay well i know a couple of guys there so they introduced uh phil to us and um and the, yeah just the growth and the speed at which phil developed was was ridiculous like <laughs> it was ridiculous man first yeah. first couple of years first year or two year and a half didn't really you know didn't really notice it and then suddenly i remember i think the day that i remember most vividly was there was a lash any um, from some scaffolding to landing on 
like a railing mm-hmm. and he was uh, he, he he just went up and did it and i was like oh, yeah, whatever i'll do that as well and i hung there and looked at it and i just thought oh actually i need to think about this <laughs> it's not just something that i can do um and that was i think it was only about i don't know 14 15 at that time and then he just yeah just yeah. shot that was insane yeah special talents sometimes can come in and just it's great the whole freaking world for you like i have yeah uh i i had this um lache between two tree branches and the second tree branch was really thick mm. so uh it was like nine feet um and it took me like six months to get this lache Damn. and yeah so then i took my level three student group there and I had this 11 year old boy oliver and he did it on his first try don't just know <laughs> All of a man, <laughs> out to make a man feel inadequate. <laughs> yeah, and then and then later he incredible. He did the swing to precision on it, which was he was the only person to ever do that. And he, at the time he was fifteen, and he'd actually mostly stopped doing parkour. He was just skateboarding. Uh, really, he just like showed up and yeah, he was like without training, without any weight training, without any specific jump training. He had like a ten and a half foot broad jump at like sixteen years old. It's so outrageous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just take whatever credit you can for teaching him. That's what I'll <laughs> do. Just cling to whatever you can. <laughs> yeah, I'm running to a few of these guys. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so you, you're training with Owen. That, that's really interesting about Christoph too. I was thinking about, um, I just had a chat with Toby Seeger from uh, from Store. Oh, yeah. And that was Good. a great chat. And we were talking about how how, uh, how Teg influenced him, right? And how Teg's yeah. like, really yeah. kind of this very influential character who like nobody yeah. knows um, and I, yeah, it's just one of these like guys, these stealthy guys who's just like in the background developing the scene. Yeah, but Teg was 16 and he kind of took Toby under his wing when Toby was 12. Mm. It's massive influence. And I'm just thinking about like how your whole idea of parkour was influenced by someone who was a year older than you, right? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? So it's kind of interesting how like that discipline brought out this, this leadership and mentorship and very young men. And helping other other young men, um, mostly at that stage it was all young men, women. Uh, yeah, I guess you had Flame, Liv. Who was yeah, there. yeah, Liv was that. Yeah, yeah, she was Cambridge as well. That's right. But yeah, but otherwise, there's not really many other girls at all. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, no, it's funny. Right. Yeah, I think. Sorry, man. Um, I was just gonna say, I think. Um, I, I don't know why it was that he. I think just coming from a formal martial arts background, having trained with certain people, he brings this kind of authority um, at the time. And we were just open to absolutely anything. We were just sponges, right? Anyone that we've met, we, we just want to learn, we'd soak it up. And um, so, yeah, we were all ears when when he came. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that for those early days of parkour, like if you had a, a gymnastics or martial arts background, you were mm-hmm. almost- light years ahead or b-boy <laughs> like oh absolutely right? yeah 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 capoeira um so that was my background right like everyone was asking me to teach like within six months of like doing starting parkour because mm. i could do backflips and front flips and all everything from, from doing gymnastics that is light years ahead at that time i remember when someone was it concept of dash some guys in is it netherlands or somewhere in some Scandinavian country did like a, a palm spin, yeah, and um, published a video of that. It blew everyone's mind, and then the wall spin was next, and mm-hmm. yeah, just the the edges with a boundary with when within which everyone was practicing was so small, and someone would like edge it out, and he'd go, oh, and then and eventually it just kind of just started to blow up like this. Um, but it didn't take much for someone to like really stand out at that time. It was, it was great. <laughs> The stuff that's considered really basic now, or you know, yeah, a lot of young men who can, you know, uh, a lot of young men and women who can do a corkscrew, you know, um, at mm-hmm. 13 years old, it's like a, a base trick, for, you know, like a, I remember it was like, you on the road could do it. <laughs> that's it, ridiculous. But you know, another skill that I think that I've actually been working on a lot recently is just dialing my climb up, right? Um, oh, yes, yes, fond memories of just doing gas climb ups, yeah. Great. So in the early days of parkour, I I just destroyed my elbows doing climb ups. So mm. I couldn't 
couldn't put the the, the work in to do it. And then when I went out and in nature, I, I realized that like in nature, you never find a flat wall with a flat ledge on top. It's like crazy. everything in nature is either much harder to climb up on or much easier. Very rarely you find that like exactly climb up one. Yeah. Level. And it's mossy and all this kind of stuff. Whereas we'd be in town being like, well, we need to find the perfect lip so you can do a all in one climb up sort of that, that British brick is really nice, man, when it comes to climbing. <laughs> Super sweet. <laughs> So um, it's, that's <laughs> funny what you start to appreciate. It's like yeah. all your friends are going out, getting kind of drunk and doing whatever, and you're like, "Oh man, this is great! <laughs> the texture on this wall is fantastic." Like, what am I doing? <laughs> Aficionados, urban wall. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, so yeah, so so anyways, I for a variety of reasons, basically, um, I've ended up training in this uh, indoor ninja gym a lot recently, and they've got some walls that are great for climbing. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna dial the skill in. Finally, just like it's been a it's been a process, man. Like I like I I started really working on it last last year, and then I took the summer off because I was outdoors teaching, and then uh, mm-hmm. and then I got back into it this fall. So I've taken my climb up from like two seconds down to one point four seconds. I'm trying to get it down to like one second flat for the climb up. That's that is rapid. Yeah, that's a big it's, it's a big drop in the time. I don't even thing is I can't even. I've never measured the time of a climb up, so I have no idea. It, it sounds fast, basically. Like <laughs> it's all right. Fair enough. I think all the good guys now are like between one point one and t- you know, like they're around one second flat for a climb. Is this how uh, granular things have got now that we have standards? Yeah. You know, you got bench and deadlift yeah. standards, the body weight. Yeah. We've now got that for climb ups. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. Oh, I'd like to parkour athlete at this stage. Like you have to have like a standing broad jump. You know, near 10C, you have to be able to do a climb. Interesting. You know, in around a second. Um, mm. That kind of thing. That's, that's crazy. But uh, in the event, um, I was thinking about it. I was like, I think that yours were some of the first climbs I saw that were bilateral straight up to like landing, you know, with relatively straight arms. Right? And everyone else was going chicken wing, elbow up, <laughs> elbow on, right? Yeah. Did, can we? <laughs> well, it was like first we're doing, I don't even, yeah, yeah. It was like elbow, <laughs> just go there, I don't <laughs> push down. And then, how about muscle up, chicken wing? Whoa. And then there was the like this, right? Where the mm-hmm. no touches, but one kind of front crawl. Yeah. One shoulder goes up first. Tyson Checker, who was the guy I co founded, uh, yeah, Tyson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was an extraordinarily him. powerful climber and he could do those like, symmetrical climb ups really really fast like there was a debate Mm -hmm. remember about whether it was going to be faster to do the asymmetrical one shoulder first versus yeah and then a lot of his videos he used to wear if i remember correctly like jeans he used to train in jeans and just (laughs) just doing these huge like really fast powerful runs in jeans yeah they did build different in america man (laughs) (laughs) that issue was definitely Um, yeah do you do you remember that? Do you remember getting that scale and like was that a unique in the community? Um, yeah. yeah, I def I was quite I think I was quite consciously trying to get better at climb ups. Um I don't know why. I don't know what kind of I think I think we got sort of so obsessed with the micro skills of a lot of the at that time limited inventory of parkour moves that climb up seemed to be an obvious bottleneck to try and sort of improve um and so we went through periods of doing climb ups in a weighted vest kind of try and do 50 in a row or something but probably you know looking back substandard way to kind of get more power for a single repetition movement but at the time it was just greasing the groove and doing it so much and then i got really obsessed with a one arm climb up for a while (laughs) and and somehow didn't get tendonitis, which was amazing. But I managed to, uh, not on a fully, fully flat, but like a slight lip, um, sort of. It was a real chicken wing though, and then a dip and that sort of thing. But um, I just, yeah, I just had spent a lot of, <laughs> a lot of time uh, doing a lot of climb ups, like a big opportunity cost for other things in my life, I suppose. But yeah, it was, <laughs> it was something that, uh, yeah, we we did, we we kind of grilled each other on and took the piss out of each other if we thought something was sloppy with a climb up um and because 
Cambridge at the time had a lot of development and construction going on. There was often scaffolding all over the place. So we were really blessed to have tons of scaffolding, really out of public view and in quite private little areas that you could just spend eight hours doing muscle ups and pull ups and um plyme I don't even know if what the real names, you know, the plyometric oh, dinos. <laughs> Di- dinos. How could I forget? Yeah, dinos what I'm talking about. So dino pull ups um and that sort of thing. So I think just yeah, just it was just volume and just enjoying it really. And then you know when you start to think you're getting quite good at a thing, you just do it more, more, more. Yeah, yeah. So probably to to the neglect of other skills that I should have been training. Um, but yeah, it was quite a it was quite a deliberate thing on our, our, I think at that time. So I'm curious what time period that was because like I think around 2006 in the states, 2006, 2007. I can remember mm-hmm. basically there were three guys who could do clean climb ups. It was just Tyson, Levi Mielenberg, and Ryan Ford. And mm-hmm. it was very fascinating because they were trying to teach other people to do it. And they were, and I noticed that what they were cueing people to do was actually not what they were doing. So oh, interesting. Nobody had, yeah. Nobody had articulated the role of the swing leg. <sighs> Everyone was telling, right, everyone, coming out to get you the momentum up. Yes. Yeah. Instead of swinging oh. the lower leg, I think they were just trying to sabotage everyone out so they could keep the top spot. Like, <laughs> so it's just both legs is crazy. Yeah, but I think that you, you like you, at really talented athletes, they just adopt smart problem solving, but they don't necessarily have. Oh, absolutely! They necessarily know they can't describe exactly what they're actually doing a lot of the time. Yeah, so I like, think I, that, was, that was something I realized way later, seeing different people and realizing. Teaching a thing and doing a thing are such different skills and being able to articulate those steps. Yeah. It's because you just assume, oh, you can do a backflip. Why don't you teach people? Like, you just underappreciating the absolute the difficulty in trying to teach something like that. They're not, they're not knowing the how and knowing how to help someone else are not the same thing at all. No, it's nuts. Yeah. So, so obviously one of the big kind of themes of the early days was the, uh, the war between the purists and the, uh, <laughs> freestyle parkourists. Um, how did that all develop? Like you said, you met Owen initially through urban free flow. I'm trying to remember now. It was, um, I'm pretty sure it was through a guy who was training in Cambridge at the time, but I can't remember whether we had a little sub kind of Cambridge forum on urban free flow or something i think we did um, and people we did yeah we did attract and get a few other practitioners through that but um yeah no i, I can't remember the exact way that we met to be honest um but yeah the the whole freestyle versus pure parkour thing was really interesting i, I don't know i don't know what to kind of think about it really i remember so i remember that free running was how parkour was introduced to us via jump london that was how it was packaged and then the more we sort of do you remember parkour.net the forum yeah Yeah. so that was well back in the day yeah fantastic forum really really good um and i think so many of the concepts and things that I learned was through that. And so like free running was the thing that was sold as, and then started to learn a bit more about um, parkour as the original discipline. Um, probably owe quite a bit to urban free flow with that, to be honest as well, because at the time it was a, it was a really cool, really positive kind of group and organization. And I think a lot of the UK's growth early on has, has a fair bit to, you know, it owes a fair bit to urban free flow at the time, but then obviously it went quite pathological quite quickly. Um, <laughs> it's funny to think uh, in some way Paul Corkery was a positive contributor to the uh, right <laughs> world parkour community because I mean, urban free flow wasn't just for you guys, like that's where we all found each other on in the Washington Park. Yeah, we went really to good, yeah. the American sub forum of that's right, urban free flow and Washington Park. So when I and there was a Washington forum. So when I first started in 2005, there were six guys who were communicating about parkour in that little forum. More than enough. Yeah. And so I went down to Seattle to meet up with these six guys. One of them promptly broke his leg trying to do a front flip after Dan and I did him. Uh, so like, brilliant. 
We were down by, you know, what's <laughs> one? In some percentage, there's quite a significant. But seventeen percent of the community <laughs> disappeared after the first jam. Uh, and then we found Tyson, who was down in Portland, and he came up and uh, you know became the kind of the charismatic leader in a lot of ways. Awesome, but uh, yeah, it was like that was. And then then we were like, oh no, this is. We don't want to be associated with with Urban Fleet Flow anymore, so we created the Washington Park War Forum. But by that time, like the TCT Forum already existed. Did TCT precede Urban Park War? Because I feel like it was somehow like a collaboration almost of you guys and Jerome. Yeah, I think there was some merging that happened, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I th- oh, I'm trying to remember now. You <laughs> were the TCT. Yeah. <laughs> you don't remember? <laughs> I don't really remember, dude. <laughs> but yeah, no, we had a forum, yeah. And uh, yeah, that became merged with Park Hall Don, if, if my memory serves me correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, so that was netparkour.net. Right, be yeah, first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like that's the yeah. first thing I found when I searched parkour, and it was it was uh-huh. it was that was really important to me because like you saw David, and I mean mm-hmm. it's amazing to go back and look at what David accomplished in the '90s, right? Like that jump that he does in um, in uh, in the Rush Hour commercial, the big building to building jump in that, like can with the uh, standing gainer as well. Yeah, uh, some point in it off the rooftop. Yeah. Yeah, all of that. that. Yeah, but that that gap, that running, that running gap just, jump. I I don't know that anyone has done a bigger gap jump to this day. It is it is phenomenal. It is insane. I mean, Owen actually, we're talking. I think a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I think I texted him just to kind of emphasize the brevity of life and our mortality. And I said, you know, man, we started parkour almost coming on 20 years ago now yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was like you bastard um and i think yeah that sparked a conversation about a video that came out i don't know if you remember this one of david bell doing a running cat pass arm jump in like a multi-level car park yeah and he was i think he was what mid 30s at the time that yeah. kind of age if I, I might be wrong but that's in my memory and i was thinking about that movement and how I am now, and realizing that his longevity and his ability to perform at such a ridiculous level, and he, he was notorious for not really breaking any bones as well. I remember in interviews, he's like, oh, I've really broken a bone in my life. Yeah. And to be the first guy to be doing all of that and to still be so ahead of the curve is, is just bonkers. But uh, yeah. I think it's a totally different topic, but I think that's part of the reason it's such a shame that he didn't take a more central role internationally because I, I guess just his personality, he just did he just didn't kind of want that or gel with that. But I think so many people would have been behind him and on board. And I know there were things like uh uh not WFF, um some of the or poured out uh, Parkour.org and stuff. Yeah, there were a few different kind of Are you things that started to. For you, it was uh, Power. You're thinking of Power. Pa- power, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Parkour Worldwide Association or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. It is, it's crazy how he just sustains himself. I'd love to know what he's doing now, if he's still training. But yeah, it's, it's bananas. Start with having a dad who's the best athlete in all of France. So that's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good start. Um, yeah. I, but, you know, I brought that up. I mean, it's, it's, it's really fascinating what he accomplished, but also, like, it, it made it hard to think that you could do parkour when you saw his video. Like, probably Jump Britain or Jump London was a bit more approachable. Like, Johan and Jerome, mm-hmm. they, were, they were not, they didn't seem quite as much like superheroes. As uh, yes, we did. So I went to liparkour.net and I saw like videos of young teams of parkour athletes who'd done like a year of parkour training. And it was like, oh, it's not just like jumping between building and doing gainers, it's like vaulting over rails and stuff. And that made it so much more approachable. And so that was that was where I started. So I saw the parkour to net, and then there was urban free flow, and then I found you guys and the TCT forms. And I didn't really interact with the TCT forms much, but I, that's when I started becoming aware of of like the fact that there was a big gap between 
what had been practiced in France and what was becoming popularized in the English speaking world and became sort of attached to like, I want to know what, what the actual discipline is, you know, coming from a martial arts background, it was like, I was already aware of how commercialization distorts disciplines and like stuff gets diluted and turns mm -hmm. into bullshit. And so I wanted to, to get to the source of it. And then, and then that was around, that must've been late in 20, and I think that was late in like 2006 or maybe even early 2006, you guys, yeah. uh, and Jerome, it was Jerome Pinard, right? From, yeah, I think so. Uh, the, and uh, Erwin Lacour was involved quite heavily in that as well. He went on for obviously uh, Mobnat and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. He just came out of the woodworks like, who's this guy? Like, he's yeah. doing all this crazy stuff, talking about quadrupedal movements and all this kind of stuff. That was mind blowing as well. It was such you a funny park forum. You remember his swimming parkour? John. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot about this. <laughs> yeah. That thread was just enormous. <laughs> I uh can't park or be swimming. Oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> I uh I loved it. I um uh I've been getting into canyoneering. I think this is like a really cool like edge space for parkour athletes to go in and explore. Mm. And we have some really great canyons here in the northwest with the big mountains. So I uh I found this spot where you can um like jump between two boulders, vault off the second boulder, drop into a creek, um drop into a pool, climb up out of the pool, jump into another pool, swim across it and water slide down into the next pool, do another jump, rad. another jump, and then another water slide. That sounds brilliant. It's and you've got the, you've got the environment for it there. Here, here I'd be like sliding into shopping trolleys and the bottom <laughs> of the rivers and stuff. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Yeah. You got to get up to the peaks or uh, the, the yeah. one there out to Wales. That's right. I thought, you know, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure there is. Yeah, a bit of canyoneering and things. Yeah. Uh, I've seen, actually, uh, one of my students, online students right now, is doing some exploration of the canyons up in the Lakes District. Um, oh, super cool. Okay. When we go up there, I can introduce you, get you, get you up with Charlie. He's found some pretty ways of canyons. Oh, yeah, um, man. Yeah. Ben Atkinson, another one of my friends up there, has found, like, tunnels through waterfalls like we have here and some pretty sweet cliff dives. Damn, that's rad. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. So yeah, so I posted that and I was like, is swimming parkour was the title. Um and I was Yeah. Like, less than another one says oh <laughs> I get the joke, but it still made me laugh. <laughs> another one was uh what <laughs> somebody was on a mission to try and justify why flips could be parkour. And the use case was what if you're running away from obviously a lion or someone trying to knife you or something. And there's, <laughs> there's like a shoulder high wall, but it's got barbed wire on the top of it. Yeah. And there's a, there's a drop on the other side and they've gone to the lengths, I think of kind of sketching it out, giving some measurements. I was like, okay, as a kind of premise, this is pretty specific, but let's go with it. And I think that was the one time when people could agree that probably doing a dive over this yeah. thing that's too high to jump over, you can't bolt it. And then once you've done the dive, you might you might as well do a, a front somersault was probably pretty reasonable. But that's when people were so, including myself, was so blinkered to thinking it's not about the kind of the intention or the intent of the movement. It's more what move are you doing? Oh, you're pressing X. That means it's a front flip. No, that's not allowed in parkour, which I think eventually people started to see past and think, why, why are you doing the movement? And it's not that it's because it's a specific movement. It's kind of what, in what, in service of what are you trying to reach a place or get away from something? That was kind of what it boiled down to really. It's funny. I think there's a much simpler use case for that. The flip in parkour. Like, oh yeah. Hedge, right? Hedge is not bad. Yeah, you need a bit of a well. You need an object that you have to get up and over uh -huh. that you can't vault because it's too soft. With a bit of a drop on the other side, otherwise you might as well just dive roll it. Unless you've got, unless you've got beastly front somersaults. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of good parkour athletes now who I think they're gonna they're gonna yeah, I'm sure there are. Feet and run faster. Eat that for breakfast. Yeah, dive for uh, dive flip or dive dive side over it. Um, or just run through the damn thing. <laughs> <Just. laughs> 
<laughs> Pick a foot strong is more efficient than a rock. 100 kilo frame just straight through it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> snow plow it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was one of my favorite clips in, uh, I can't remember if it was in Rage Fruit Bling or like Jangare or uh, uh, Tags running through and you see the shopping cart and you expect him to jump over it. He just runs and <laughs> shoulders it out of the way. And it was like, yeah, that, that was efficient. Good, good point, Tag. Uh, um but yeah i remember like all these arguments that treated parkour as if like you had to be expressing oh one second don't worry so as i was saying i remember all these arguments where people treated this idea that you had to be going from a to b as efficient as possible as something that you had to be doing whenever you were practicing parkour <laughs> which i mean oh, that's why because like that this is absurd. Like, like nobody's actually practicing like this and if you weren't yeah. practicing like this, like it really wasn't parkour. I was like, no, 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 it's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. It was like, no, you, so I, when I, I had to, when we formed parkour visions, I was like, the Wikipedia definition of parkour is not sufficient. And we have to have a word. Just out of whack. That was, that was such a chew on, wasn't it? Trying to, trying to get some consensus for what yeah. is parkour. But I, I'd actually forgotten how much of a, how much of a hassle and headache that whole thing was. <laughs> I think I think when Urban Free Flow, or more specifically Paul Corkery and Easy decided to come up with um freestyle parkour, that's when I'm pretty sure that's when me and Owen were just like, you know what, just whatever man. Like <laughs> we're just gonna do what we've been doing and just not care about why we're doing it or all the rest of it. And I think we got just so Got so fed up with the whole thing, and I know a lot of people wouldn't say, and just started to say, "Oh, we're just doing movement, we're doing movement," and that was before Edo Portal and all that kind of stuff. It's like, "Oh, we're just moving," and and obviously, Tag with his rage through bling, and people yeah. just thought, "Fuck it, it can't be bothered with the name for this thing anymore," because it's just, yeah. That was such a funny thing for me because I remember like getting so mad at the just moving people. It's like this is such a floppy, just like the most, like guilty as a judge. Bullshit I've ever heard. Like I remember Danny. <laughs> Being like, oh, it's just moving, man. I was like, oh, fuck off. And then later, just practicing love, man. Around and everything's moving, moving, moving. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, yeah. So I was like, well, okay, maybe I give Danny too much of a hard time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I thought that this was really funny with the freestyle parkour thing. Like, so there was free running and there was parkour. Are they the same thing? Are they a different thing? Right. Um, then Seb is the guy who forms the, the name free running. But then that's not really what he practices. It's like what we, what the whole community starts calling free running, isn't at all what Seb's into for practices. Yeah, yeah, an, and it was probably some not political, but some some other reason that the name was formed. And then people get so hung up on it, like, oh no, no, we're doing free. So it doesn't matter. He he just didn't use that name because it's a it's more it was just easy to remember for hardcore like, with yeah. bring the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It was uh, <laughs> the producer of. Of the like Christed, uh, yeah, London, I think, who was like, yeah, we we got to have an English name, and Seb came up with free running. That's my understanding. Yeah, free running, yeah, <laughs> and then people form their entire identity of it and get right. like, yeah. down the rabbit hole. It's yeah. funny. So then, 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 then you know, Urban Free Flow is like, we've got to announce it. We've solved it. We're gonna like <laughs> all the problems <laughs> in the community. It's gonna this to bed. Put this to bed. Freestyle parkour. Universal hatred, right? If it's just like, no, just flip the table. Yeah, we are just, you could have gone down at your words. Yeah. So then, then fast forward, right? Years pass and parkour, uh, competitive formats of parkour come out. And like right away, basically, we, we kind of go into a speed division, like time trials and a style division. And, um, and so we, so like the guys from uh, from Origins Parkour uh, start having these, you know, they they have eventually skill, speed, style. That becomes first the North American Parkour Championships and Sport Parkour League, and uh, and they're like, yeah, we don't like the term free running. It's like we should just call it freestyle parkour. <laughs> fine, that's fine. <laughs> and I was like, guys, do you do you not remember? When that was for full circle, <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. maybe he was on something, maybe easy. Man, maybe yeah, I mean, I think at that point, we should have given him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I think at that point, easy had uh, well, I think it actually makes a sense in context now. It's a, actually a competitive format that people do, it's the freestyle, yeah, 
of parkour. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but at oh, the time, it's just yeah, it's just too 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 many too many uh, just definitional like wankery to. It, it was it was it, at the time it was kind of uh, it was not addictive, but you did fall into certain camps and find yourself being oh, in your life. And I remember when people were um, printing T-shirts with anti-competition and anti-competition. I was involved in and, that. And, yeah, yeah. And you had to copy of that one. The main architects, so the main architects oh, yeah. pro parkour, cool. anti-competition were me, Irwin Lacour, and Duncan Germain, TK-17. TK-17. <laughs> that was not, um, not one of my proudest moments. Um, to be fair, though, but you know, at the time, in hindsight, it's, you think, you know, whatever. But at the time, it feels like an existential crisis that you're going through as a community. Is well, it's a weird, it, weirdly. I mean, in a sense, it hasn't, it hasn't gone away. Like we've matured. There's more nuance and understanding of it now. But like we still have fake trying to hone in on what we're doing. And true, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it does matter. It does matter because it, yeah, it really does because. What yeah? What are you trying to transmit? And the original parkour that was sort of had um, transmitted from France in you know not a very efficient way. It was more mysterious Chinese whispers about being really efficient and and reaching areas really fast and speedily and all this kind of stuff. That. That was something that people really treasured, I think, at the beginning because it had a real obvious um, goal to it. It was, oh, and it had a lot of parallels with martial arts, which, which um, gave sort of a framework for people to practice within. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you're you're a group of people going out and hanging around building sites and just sort of jumping on and off things. And if you look at it as a pedestrian, you think, what the hell are these kids doing? But internally, you have a framework in your mind um, that's guiding you. It's kind of it's when you adopt any craft, you basically you, you get this map in kind of put onto the world in front of you with these little bright spots. And suddenly, and I remember it was, it was the classic thing, wasn't it? Oh, you know, a railing becomes your um, obstacle that you can do a vault over, and a building becomes your playground. Okay. And it, it sounds really corny, but it is. Anything that you do, if if you're a carpenter, you'll start to appreciate trees and how they are formed and the different qualities and characteristics, and you'll see the world through that lens. And then, if you're doing parkour, at the time, I'd see the world through the lens of, and it was, and people spoke about it as if it was like a psychiatric condition, and you'd be walking with people, and suddenly someone would be, like, oh man, what, what if you, oh, what if you go up there and do a cat boss there, and then that would just spark off some challenge and you'd be there for four hours when you're just trying to go to Tesco to buy some lunch or something. Um, so it, it, the reason that it matters is because you're implanting these kind of frameworks into people's brains um, for them to practice through. So if, if you get it wrong, then you get a different product, a different like, intention from the practitioners. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a lot of utility to saying, open it up movement is just whatever you want it to be and incorporate everything and i think ultimately that's totally fine but i think when you're starting out on something and i think the the benefit for me was that you have to have some framework and and guardrails to kind of guide you down a path of development otherwise you're spinning your wheels um yeah so so yeah i think i don't know what the state of things is now but i know fix you know, peripherally yeah, I'm curious is a contentious that. issue. I don't know that much either in a way because I mm -hmm. kind of like created my own sandbox. Like I've, I've never tried to like, nice. so I worked with Irwin on the development of Moonat back in 2007, 2008. Oh, cool. Yeah. And one of the big points of conflict between us was that he had decided that he wanted nothing to do with the parkour community. He, he wanted to separate Moonat perceptually from parkour as much as possible um and i was like that's just disingenuous like 
Mm. Like most of the skills you're teaching are literally just taken straight from parkour and your are George Hebert and all that and the origin uh, it's taken from George Hebert but like I, I don't know the the full story of how but like obviously you know there was a point at which he was really picking up from and inspired by and trying to emulate and trying to learn from you know and I mean I've heard that, you know, he's trying to claim that he was there with the original guys at, you know, private event. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Obviously, it had an influence. And so, to me, the, the, the attempt to sort of separate movement from parkour was really disingenuous. And so, with, when I was developing Evolve of Play, I was always like, it's, it's parkour as a base code plus these other things that I want to bring in, right? Um, parkour mm -hmm. taken back to nature plus martial arts plus, plus play research plus whatever. Um, and I always wanted to maintain that connection with it. But for a long time, it was like most of the parkour community wasn't interested in going into nature with me. And my, the clients I was approaching or I was attracting came to me via Edo or via MoveNet. Um, and so I kind of lost touch with what was happening in the dynamics of the community in a lot of ways. And then now I live in a small town where we have like, we have a very interesting community of parkour athletes because we have like, seven parkour athletes here in town who all have like a decade plus of experience so we'll mm -hmm. go into the ninja gym we all meet at the ninja gym and it's like a pretty insanely high skill group group of guys yeah but there's like not really a young community right like it's just and it's been it's nice. this group for a long time it's nice in a way i mean you want you want it to be growing one of the reasons I wanted to bring up about the Ninja Gym about why I think it's like we really do have to think about the sort of story that we set up and the the the, the definitions actually do matter. Mm -hmm. It's um, like parkour has really struggled to attract a female practitioner base. You know, like. In my That's true, isn't it? Yeah, even even now, after yeah. twenty years, yeah, twenty years, man, twenty years in, I would say that it's still ninety percent male. Yeah, and I had kind of like I'm I'm okay with the idea that men and women are different, and that's okay. Like I don't I don't think yeah. it has to be equally distributed, and I don't mind being in spaces there where it's just guys. It's very comfortable and nice sometimes to just be like, hey, but when I go out to do parkour, I get to just be in a space with other men, and that's nice. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have two daughters, right? And I went to the yeah. ninja gym, and I realized that at the ninja gym, which is basically a weird version of parkour as far as I'm concerned, half the practitioners are female. And they have this whole huh. group of like 11 to 13-year-old girls who are super skilled. Like their lachet level is crazy. No way. And what do you think it is that's different about that then? I, I think it's because... Ninja Warrior had a financial incentive to pursue a female audience from the beginning. And they, and they did. Female athletes. Yeah, they had good role models as well, didn't they? Because the females on that were yeah. just monsters, like absolute yeah. beasts. I remember um, I competed in 2011 at uh, mm -hmm. Ninja Warrior, and I met Casey Catanzaro um, at that, who was dating one of the guys from Tim's Free Running at the time. And so I was kind of following her as she was doing stuff just, just a little bit. I was like, oh, I'm curious. When I saw her name pop up with the ninja stuff, I was curious about it. And then she became the first woman to ever do the warp wall. She was five foot one. And um, and the, you know, the, the television show did a huge feature on her, made a huge deal out of it, celebrated her accomplishing. And I think that attracted women in to Ninja Warrior. And then uh obviously Jesse Graff now is like this superstar in Ninja and she's an incredible athlete. And so I think there's a way in which like you can see how that creates a perception and an incentive structure that creates these self-reinforcing dynamics. And something about parkour created a self-reinforcing dynamic that's made it not as attractive. Mm -hmm. And so I bring that up as an example just because if something like Fig comes in and it takes over the competitive format and gets a lot of high prestige events running that are very diluted forms of parkour, it, it will have an impact on the community. It will have an impact on on what's incentivized, right? The the I don't know if you've seen the the Fig competitions. 
They have. Uh, I, <laughs> I've, I've seen like one or two clips and I was like, oh, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I mean, it's kind of cool because they have races where it's a, it's a 1v1 race where you're, mm. where you have a series of parkour obstacles and you race to the, no, to one side and back, right? So in theory, like being able to set up a course that's the same on two sides that two athletes can go down is exciting and cool, but the course is really boring. That's it. Yeah, that's what really struck me. It was like no imagination around the obstacles or, yeah. It was it was, it was like uh, just a really beta version of parkour. If someone described it to someone over like Morse code and then they had to make parkour, it's like, well, I kind of, I think that's about what it is. Um, but it just loses that richness. Um, yeah. And, and I guess they'll be, I, I suppose they'll be also optimizing for um, reproducibility and scalability and all of that stuff rather than just making something really, really cool and authentic. And it's easier to have simple obstacles and, and uh, get your branding right and all that stuff. So, okay. The uh, the SPL competitions in com mm -hmm. uh, in comparison, what the guys from Origins put on, and like the the level of thought and detail and unique structure that goes into each speed run that they give to the athletes, mm -hmm. so much more compelling. It's so much more of an expression. Like like it, it, when I look at the course that that the fig guys are putting on, I don't want to go train on it, right? <laughs> I'm not excited, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> this looks or, yeah. right? When I see something Origins put on, I think if I was good enough, that looks incredibly fun as you do. I just, yeah. yeah. That's a really good heuristic, isn't it? Like if you want to go there and train on the stuff, yeah. Or you want to be around the people who are doing it mm -hmm. um, and involved in the competition, that, that means that it has been put on with the right intention by the right people. Um, mm -hmm. And you have skin in the game and know what it's like from the athlete's perspective. And they're not just viewing it from the audience's, what they imagine the audience would want's perspective. Uh, it doesn't sound like they've got that right. But if they, you know, if they, if it's in the Olympics, right? And the athletes that they see win at the Olympics are, are the athletes that the next generation is admiring. I mean, this is, this is, this goes back to this other kind of topic that I think is interesting is, I keep thinking about how unique it felt to do parkour in the aughts, right? Like how it was, it did feel like life-changing stuff, right? It did. Yeah, it did. It really did. Um, that's very true. And it's hard to kind of put your finger on it, really. I think that there's definitely something to be said for being around a an activity that is fairly formed and you're part of its evolution that's super exciting and uh, th th i mean there's not many things where you have the opportunity to do that because most things in the world are pretty established and a lot of things that do newly get formed are trash because because most most new th you know most new things suck yeah most new things suck. it's hard to get something that's uh like like most businesses fail it's hard to get something that really stands the test of time and is really valuable and really good and so to be involved in something like parkour's development um, insofar as seeing it come over from France and, and, and kind of experiencing it growing up was super exciting. And, and I think the, the most, some of the other really appealing things for me were I was always crap at like team sports and kind of crap at just conventional sports, um, in a really, a really big way. Actually, the only thing that I really enjoyed and gravitated towards in school was trampolining but I had no technical ability and and kind of gymnastics where the gym teacher was like a uh he was like a part-time teacher he just didn't care he'd set up big things and allow us to jump off so I didn't really get into anything conventional from a sports perspective but then suddenly you've got this thing where um there's, there's no real boundaries um and as I say it you kind of Rather than feeling like I'm a kid that goes to school or I'm a, a teenager that just goes to school and goes home and hangs out with my friends, when you put on your kind of parkour kind of like vision and then look around the rest of the world, suddenly everything is applicable to you and everything is you can interact with. Um, 
and missions kind of announce themselves uh, and whether that's in nature or with an urban environment. And one of the crazy things about it as well was the fact that you could train at a spot that seems pretty basic, but like seven, eight years later, you're still finding new stuff. So there's this really weird depth about it as well, where you can be in the same environment, but like internally, your internal landscape is evolving and forming as well. And then you're you're interacting with the physical environment and coming up with new things. And that that in itself is really, really satisfying. Um and just I don't know, man, it's weird. It's, it's I, I can't really express why it was such a like a, it did feel like a sort of unique thing to be able to do. Um Yeah. I think it's an edge, right? Like anytime you're in an edge. Yeah space that's an exciting space to be in also like mm-hmm. what you're saying about the how you can see the world in a certain way and then i can, can continually get depth to it um that reminds me a lot of like the the kind of research i've done on jordan peterson's work and john bravaki's work about what gives me to life like the meaning in life literature has the mm-hmm. aspect of like what how are you able to connect with the world and like you said like a carpenter sees wood and sees what can be turned into a parkour athlete sees the environment around them and sees the way they can interact with it. And it that is literally like just a source of meaning. Like there's literally more meaning in the environment for you as you walk through it because you did part mm-hmm. one, because you do mm-hmm. part one. The other aspect of it that I've been thinking about is also specifically in reference to something uh, Jordan Peterson was talking about recently is this idea that like we have these developmental stages and then we go through, you know, as children and then young adults and like what we do as we're kind of moving away from being primarily defined by our relationship with our parents to primarily defined by our relationship with our peer groups is we want to adopt a group identity. Mm-hmm. As we as we start to individuate, there's a messianic stage where you want to become, you want to save the world. And part of what was happening with parkour was like the entire community was made up of people in the group identity stage and the messianic stage. First, yeah, I can think of some people more than others. Yeah, <laughs> and and so it it had this sense that like this is who we are. It's central to our identity and it's world changing. Both mm. and it actually is really fundamentally valuable and important. And it was we did discover something like it's really weird that. There were skateboarding, surfing, snowboarding, <laughs> mountain biking, rollerblading, which are all basically locomotion through the environment. But nobody had developed the discipline of just locomoting through the environment without any, mm. any. Um, it, it it didn't have any like large cultural cachet. Bouldering was a thing, right? Bouldering to me is just parkour on a very narrow set of obstacles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A limited set of obstacles, and so like yeah, it was like the most fundamental form of play was somehow undiscovered and we discovered it. Um, mm, I think that's why, I think that might, must partly be why thinking back, some of us, including me, were quite defensive about the utility aspect of parkour because that was part of the meaning. Yeah. Um, the, as you mentioned, the messianic stage, like I need to save the world and do something valuable and bring value to the world. It's like, oh, be strong to be useful. Yeah. If I... <laughs> Somehow, if I train this weird niche activity, I could be useful. And so buying into that gave this extra layer of meaning, which, you know, it's it's highly questionable when you look back on it in <laughs> some ways, uh, in, in the way that it was sold to be yeah. in so far as, oh, you can, you can uh, like sprint up some lady's house and stop the burglar from breaking in or do something practical. But it's more the psychological tools that you develop, which can be useful. Um, but I think that just the idea tools are not unique to parkour. No, they're not. Absolutely. That's right. And I think that's certainly and thinking back to Owen, that's that's what led me and Owen down different kind of activities to explore that because we started to realize that and became quite adamant that actually parkour wasn't special. So we went through this cycle of saying, Oh yeah, they're really unique and you know, Yes, yeah. and then we came full circle. And we were like, you know what? This is just another vehicle for self development. Yeah. That things like, and we tried things like praying mantis kung fu, uh, <laughs> um, other things like weightlifting, uh, climbing, bouldering, 
um, and then going down the entire sort of conditioning side of parkour where people doing hell nights and and that side of things as well and my parkour practice started to morph more into just a, a just a physical challenge for the sake of challenge practice which is including fun. yeah that's true yeah and and i think that's why i became more and more convinced at least at that time that you know it's oh it's just about movement because all of this stuff is a vehicle for self-development um but but your point of parkour being so stripped back is free. You just need your body. You don't even need any clothes or shoes, although that might get you in trouble. And, um, and you just need a space. Even, even with, like, if you really push it to its absolute limit without any obstacles, mm -hmm. you'd be quite hard pushed. But as we mentioned before, there's a depth of, finding new things within a certain space and that is also part of the challenge of parkour it's not uh what's the best environment i can find with all the coolest obstacles it's no what can you do with this environment that's in front of you that's on you and you take responsibility for for actually trying to create certain things and challenges and and that was i think the best part about training with other people and i sort of really missed later on when i was training because the the speed at which you'd develop and co-develop some weird challenge or mission in partnership with one or two other people. And what started off as just some simple thing, like transformed into some horrendous kind of fingernail and uh, hang on challenge with this thing. You can't put your foot here. And if you do, then you have to start again and all that kind of stuff. Um, that you do get that in other sports and other activities, but other activities and sports, are more confined and more boxed in. I think I still think that's true. Like if you're playing football, cricket, um, yeah, and all this gymnastics, traditional team sports. But I, yeah, I think that like what I would call all the locomotive sports, there's a there, like obviously there's differences, right? Like you know, there's a way in which challenges come together in. Like one of the things about like Toby Sear was talking about how he really enjoys bouldering right now because yeah, it feels like he can put a hundred percent effort into bouldering. Whereas it feels like if he keeps putting a hundred percent effort into the things that he excels at in parkour, he'll eventually kill himself. Just crash. Because right. he's so at the edge already, isn't he? Like how much more yeah. Like if he's if he's doing the biggest double Kong that he can do, like he has to hold a little bit back in the tank because mm -hmm. he'd fall, right? If he's, you know, going for a dyno and he's got pads underneath him, like he can go a hundred, a hundred percent. So there, there is a distinction there. And I think like, you know, like you ski or you surf or you snowboard and your ability to like stay in a flow state for a prolonged period of time in a run is much higher than it is in parkour because we gas ourselves out much faster. Like when you're skiing, you can get, you know, minutes on end of uninterrupted. Mm -hmm locomotive flow state right but like when you're doing parkour you can't express the high levels of scale for more than like 20 30 seconds right sure. so there are distinctions i think parkour is really cool because of how how well you can kind of articulate the aspects of fear or you get to really look at your process mentally like i, I compare it to my experience with martial arts Obviously, like fighting somebody who is big and skilled and powerful is scary, but you're reacting the whole time, right? You're you're not you're not having in some sense to choose to jump into the situation in the same. Way. You're just there. <laughs> it's like you know, once the punch is flying at you, you get to the yeah. reflexive aspect of your brain, which. Mm -hmm. It's still an ongoing like dealing with fear, and you have these really interesting moments of fear that happen. Like if you're if you're pinned underneath somebody who's got side control on you, and they're just a huge dude, and your breath is getting compressed out. Dude, of I started. I I signed up to freestyle wrestling in September. Uh, I got injured. Um, I'm like two months out of it now, but I never experienced fatigue and awesome. pressure like I have in something like that form of grappling. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and as you say, you just you just in kind of brainstem, get me the hell out of here mode, and just yeah, it all goes out of the window.
and and it's interesting too because like so you, with with wrestling i think usually like the time spans are very short so you don't get kind of exposed as long but like with with grappling you actually have with like jujitsu you have to choose to tap sometimes just because you're too tired just because yeah. it's too overwhelming because otherwise you'll actually just i've i've done it i've done it to myself i've had panic attacks because i because i you we, can't it's air hunger isn't it yeah you're just like mm-hmm. it's not that i couldn't breathe it was that i i was i was struggling to breathe and i didn't feel like there was a way out and mm-hmm. i was just stuck in that situation for sufficiently long that like when it came when when the situation ended it was like my nervous system had just been completely destroyed right it's so, an insane feeling yeah, it's yeah insane it, feeling. It, you know, like it's like getting stuck in like a like a like a tunnel cave in or something right and you don't know yeah what it, 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 um, it, but but with parkour like you have to choose to do the job right so you go up and you stand and you look at this thing that potentially could result in you having horrific catastrophic life ending potential injuries and you're like yeah i'm gonna do this today. <laughs> right and then you're and then you get to uh, do i really feel like i can do this mm-hmm. and you get to walk yourself through the process of like am i too amped up am i too do i have enough energy for this and you get a really to like really just it's like a really refined way of walking through the process of dealing with fear yeah the self-regulation that you need for it is and that's that's how i was thought about so people like phil doyle daniel in the blackout at the time they had you had that you kind of absolute ability and then you had your expressed ability and for me i felt like i was way yeah. like psychologically i just couldn't get up to this point but those guys were like both sides were kissing each other and that was what really separated people who physically just dominated in something like parkour because they just well, somehow just knew where that edge was for them. And and as you say, it's up to you to sort of push your yourself towards whatever that edge is. And I I think personally for me, I that was the thing I struggled with the most. And I mean, the flip side is I didn't really get any horrendous injuries from parkour and that's that's probably the benefit. Um, but on the flip, I suppose on the other side of it, I never was in absolute terrifying, like mortal danger at any point when I was training parkour. A few times when, yeah, things can go wrong and yeah, as you say, you can get horrendously injured. But um, but that's a funny personal sort of journey that you do make. And I'd found that... Um, you know when Socrates talks about like the, his daemon, sort of the, the little voice in the back of the head, and and you see is the worst thing. And we spoke about this quite often, me and the guys in Cambridge. You'd see something, <laughs> and it would kind of attract your eyes for a moment. And if you settled on it for long enough, some bloody thing would click in your head that would just say, "That's a you can do that thing there." And you think, "You son of a bitch!" Like yeah. suddenly, like yeah, it yeah. becomes this. <laughs> like this red unlocked level and then you have to go and unlock it but the process of doing that but depending on what the thing was was such an ordeal um and that's where that was where parkour really was i found when when you identified something that you thought christ i think that is actually somehow doable um and that was part of that map that you start to kind of develop within your parkour parkour vision uh, yeah. hence your name i guess yeah yeah, yeah. I, uh, when I discovered Jordan Peterson's work and he's talking about the, the hero's journey, that was like, that's, oh yeah, that that resonates a lot. We are. Yeah. That, that is the call to adventure. Right. And that's the call to dragon. And I think that's why it's so powerful. And I think in some fundamental way, it is, uh, is kind of the most fundamental expression of that because it's just you and your body and because of the speed at which it happens. Like if you're on a s- snowboard, like you, before you hit the jump, like you just get this huge amount of speed, like you're in the flow, right? In a way that you don't, I feel like you don't have as much of an opportunity to kind of turn your brain off in parkour. It mm-hmm. takes more skill. That's my sense. I am not a great snowboarder, so maybe I'm mis- uh, understanding it, but that's my sense having skied and, snow- uh, and done parkour. Is there something about parkour that, 
and it, and it is this thing that it is it's the original form of exploratory locomotor play like every juvenile animal becomes physically competent through exploratory locomotor play and for 99.999 percent of evolution we didn't have surfboards and snowboards and mountain bikes to do that for us we just did it with our bodies in the environment yeah all right all right to me yeah yeah i think so and i think for even though i've not i've not seriously trained parkour for years mm -hmm. I, I still feel like it's is there it's kind of it is it is embedded within my like my physical being yeah yeah and and trying out other different activities and things is it, it served as a really good base for that as well um it's just as a kind of general athletic development i think it's crazy how there's this idea of donor sports that's developing in the kind of motor learning community right now that certain sports teach things that then you can go and apply so mm -hmm. The example they used in the first paper that I looked at it, this was actually parkour and measuring gaps closing as actually transferring over to soccer. Mm. Because you have to see, you know, the players moving and there's a gap and there's an opportunity for action to move into that gap to, to make a pass or whatever. Um, and so there's some relationship in the, how your eye reads the environment. That's also mm. the kind of thing that's happening over in parkour. Um, obviously there's also lots of things that are different. But my experience is that parkour is a profound donor sport, right? Like, look at what's happened with Toby and his success in in rock climbing. Um, mm -hmm. For me, my experience with those, I started doing martial arts, like I said, when I was young, and then I went and did MMA. Then I took nine years off of doing. Uh, so I was a white belt in jujitsu, but I was a pretty experienced white belt. I was a high level white belt, pretty close to getting my blue belt. So I took nine years off of jujitsu, and I went back into the gym. And I'd done a little bit of sparring, but mostly kickboxing sparring with my students. I went back into the gym and I was ragdolling their blue belts and most of their purple belts and the occasional brown belt, just because I had so much pure physical ability and mm. uh, coordination, locomotive coordination. Like one of the fundamental things I think people don't realize is that any sport that involves manipulating an implement or manipulating another player is fundamentally your body moving first, right? So the first thing you have to control, like when you swing a bat, you swing your hand, right? Mm -hmm. a, yeah. A, uh, an, opponent, an, uh, an opposing player in, uh, in basketball is an obstacle, mm -hmm. right? You're having to clear that obstacle to get to the hoop. And obviously the dynamics are slightly different. The movements are slightly different. I'm not going to Kong vault over somebody's head, but there is you know if you did that <laughs> yeah I, want you. I think it's illegal um <laughs> but you'll see it you'll see guys post when they're dunking yeah. on it. <laughs> see that as a parkour movement uh but uh but yeah so it's like locomotion is fundamental and so i was i was doing jujitsu and i uh we were we were being taught this uh sweep where you had to spin up on your back and then change the direction of spin so there were basically two right. different roles happening that took you into the sweep. And I, I picked it up very quickly and the class was just totally unable to follow what the teacher was doing. And so then I was able to break it down and say, okay, you're, you're actually rotating horizontally and then rotating vertically in a specific way to get your hips in this relationship to the opposite person's hip. Bang. The students in that class in jiu-jitsu didn't have enough of a motor base and just pure locomotive ability to feel the difference between the uh, the horizontal and the vertical aspect. Yeah. And so, so like that's why gymnastics and natural and some of these other things are invented is to sort of teach that. But parkour is essentially the the er version of it. It's the foundational version of it is my perspective. For sure. Yeah, yeah. And it, but you do see it work the other way as well don't you but, but then, even then i guess i'm just thinking of gymnasts like yourself i suppose but another gymnast that i met coming into parkour but you see the sort of uh, baggage is the wrong word but some of that that they bring in and and yeah yeah well, i think gymnastics like landing with parkour right like yeah or it's just gymnastics with all the sort of like weird not all of it but a lot of the weird cultural trappings pulled off right 
Mm -hmm. it, gymnastics was supposed to be the fundamental locomotive movements of the body, right? They used to have, yeah. right? In the 1996 Olympics, they were, they compete, the men competed a hecht vault as a uh, compulsory element. A hecht vault is a straight bodied call. Mm -hmm. They had to do a Kong vault um, over the, over the, the old school table without yeah. a tuck. So they had to do it with their body completely pike, uh, straight, like no hip bend. And then they were judged. For reason. They were judged by how, how straight the body could be and how far they flew. And so they were literally doing Kong precisions. Nice. Gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Straight body. And that used to be, that was in old school gymnastics. Um, and you can go back and see all the old gymnastics manuals have Kong vaults, have flank vaults, have all the vaults. Um, and then it's been forgotten because it's become this super aesthetic oriented discipline. Um, but what I noticed with, with gymnasts is obviously they come into parkour and they're, they can, they're, they're good acrobats. They're really strong and they're used to being able to handle super high training volumes. But they have these weird spaces that they're super uncomfortable with because they've absorbed the frame of gymnastics and they often struggle to step out of it. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. One of the things that this, this one's not that important, but one of the things that someone pointed out to me early on, he was like, Oh, I know you have a gymnastics background. And I was like, Why? Because you salute. Did you land like this? <laughs> like, like she's standing up, put your hands up and you land. <laughs> Please tell me you did. <laughs> I, I don't think I did it like I hope you did, but like man. somehow my body do. was showing enough of it that, that <laughs> this person could pick up that it was like there in my head. Um, <laughs> and then, um, but like what I, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of gymnasts, for instance, really struggle to learn a shoulder roll. They can't. Yeah. yeah. It's off axis, isn't it? Yeah. They cannot. They're not allowed yeah. to be off axis. They have to go straight. Straight sideways, straight forward, straight backwards. And the same thing, like I've really struggled to learn a corkscrew because my body is like, nope, we're going to go straight over the top. It's like getting that that 45 or 90 leg slot is so uncomfortable and unnatural for me. And I didn't even do like, I wasn't like a team level gymnast who did a ton of it. I was like a shitty uh, recreational gymnast who started when I was 15 and was way too tall and heavy for support, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, like got in. Yeah, it's crazy because you just uh, you really do hold on to these habits as you. I guess that's part of the the argument for just a massively wide array of activities when you were young and not specialising too early. Because um, I think people tend to do worse if I'm if I'm not mistaken. If they just shows like to specialise, do much better. Yeah, there's a big thing with my kids because I have three kids: a ten, eight, mm. and, and five year old. So, like mm. my my son's the most. Well, my younger two are very athletically driven and then my son's older. So he's been, he's been exposed to most stuff, but he's done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a year when he was four. He did it almost a year of Capoeira. He's been doing parkour stuff with me since they've all done been doing parkour stuff with me since they were awesome and rest, awesome. wrestling with me. Um, he did a year, he's done two year seasons of rugby. Um, and then we go to the Ninja gym and then he's competing at the Ninja gym and competing at uh, track and field. But we don't yeah. train specifically for ninja skills, and we don't train specifically for track. So when he shows up, what is he now? He's eight. Ace. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, like he he ran a sixteen eighty three hundred and like a like an eight six fifty last year, which is which is like you know I think it's like eightieth percentile for like trained track athletes in his age group. Um, that's rapid yeah uh, without I guess having like really dedicated no tra to just training that yeah yeah. So, yeah just no training yeah and then he and rugby and then he uh, his vertical leap is 14 inches which is like just off the scales for kids his age like that's you know is way above the percentile chart you have, you have to go to the 12 to 13 year olds to find a percentile for that uh, I'd love to know I'd love it to just see as a thought experiment, like split test, if he just never did that and did the, the standard kids growing up stuff, iPads, blah, 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 just how he would be. Because I think physical literacy just for children gives them such confidence. Um, I don't know how he is in terms of yeah. his like externalized confidence and how he carries himself. But I remember when I was a kid, I must have been seven. And I remember just coming into contact with the 
first ever peer who was just a physical monster. And I think, I can't remember what really happened, but I was, I think I was taking the piss out of him a bit, if I'm honest. He was like a new kid that had just joined and just, I was just ribbing him a bit. And he got me in some weird headlock, did some strange judo throw on the floor. And it was just like the level of confidence that he had. And he just cruised through the school because he had this ability to carry himself. And that stuck with me when I was even that young. Um, I think it's somewhere that we're really falling down actually with, 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 with kids not, not having that literacy. Yeah. yeah, I'm writing it. I'm gonna. We just put up a blog post. We're gonna put up a blog post tomorrow. That's gonna be about yeah. managing my uh, my kids' uh, physical education and about about why we're you know as a culture we're really falling down in producing uh, healthy people because they don't. Do yeah, it's hard to strike the balance between the over like pressured father <laughs> yes. the, the, the father is just being encouraging and yeah. just trying to yeah. it is it is and uh, you know, we emphasize both lots of athletic activity lots of unstructured outdoor play time but also yes. no specialization right no early specialization sounds ideal man yeah yeah limited limited like structure it's trends in motivation not just externalized yeah to win this trophy yeah so i have to to go here in about 10 minutes. I really am enjoying this. What I wanted to kind of touch on last is we were mm. talked a lot about how important the philosophy of parkour was to us in the early generation. And like, I think a lot of people went through the state just talked about where you were like, parkour is going to save the world. I'm going to be able to save people from a burning building. You know, like we're, we're training for this to like, Actually, I'm probably never going to have to run away from somebody. <laughs> probably never going to have to run what I shot. would <laughs> save someone from a burning building. I've devoted dozens of hours. I've devoted like multiple hours every week to this activity that's basically just a hobby. What the hell am I doing? Oh, it's about the journey. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like, how do I actually take that philosophy and do something with it? Right? And I think, you know, obviously I'm in. In my yeah. range, so like he went, that tag had his whole thing about that, but a surprising number is it feels like among the kind of really early generation, a lot of guys went into service oriented positions. Like you're a uh, doctor, right? Mm -hmm. you're a doctor, uh, Chris Rowe at Blaine is a firefighter, firefighter, yeah, firefighter. I feel like there's a, quite a few of us who are like that, that be strong to be useful really got deep in and it impacted their career. So I'm curious, do you feel like that was actually critical to your career choice or was it immaterial? Oh, it'd be nice to retrospectively apply that and say yes. But no, I think actually I knew that I wanted to do something with health and physicality in the broadest sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was definitely from parkour without a doubt that that kind of made that a priority in my career choice and so when i was thinking about what to do i was toying with the ideas of personal training physiotherapy becoming an emt or a paramedic uh strength and conditioning all those sorts of things um but uh, my, my dad's a family physician and so i'd always known about medicine kind of peripherally and he seemed to enjoy his job a lot and i'd been on house calls and things with him when i was a, a kid um and seen some pretty crazy things and um it had always stuck with me actually so i think oh yeah i wanted to do something with health and i wanted to do something where i was directly working with people and trying to have some sort of impact on them and um and i, I remember when i was at university at one point i was like oh Parkour's great, movement. Da, da, da. I wonder if you could help people using movement. And that was kind of my starting point. Um, and that's why I thought about physiotherapy and things. And then that progressed a bit. And I thought about medicine. And I just thought, well, that's a nice broad field with more than enough to chew on. And so, yeah, it, the, the motivation for going towards medicine was, yeah, I guess it was rooted partly in wanting to do something useful um, and and just wanting to have 
something that was way, 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 way bigger than me that would just, I'd never be able to wrap my hands around and would just be an ongoing process of learning. That was another really deliberate thing. I was like, I need to be able to keep learning in whatever career I'm doing. And wants to be, I want to do it in health. I want to do it with people. Medicine seems to be the thing to do. So I want to go. So how do you feel like your perspective as a doctor within medicine has been impacted by that background in parkour? Like how do you feel like you differ maybe from other people in your field because you carry that, that background? I own it as. I think now I do think that medics come from loads of different backgrounds. Like uh, there's people from the merchant Navy. I've got a friend, um, people who've done jazz degrees, uh, obviously different athletes. I think there's a lot of people that, come with backgrounds that don't necessarily mean that I've got anything kind of special and unique ahead, ahead of that. But look, yeah, thinking about parkour and how it's maybe impacted for me, the main thing has been, because I've never really had much of a scientific background for my main subjects at school or A-levels, I did like art, photography, and philosophy. I had no formal training really in the sciences. And that's kind of a big thing that you need to <laughs> know from medicine, it turns out. From. So that was, uh, had a huge imposter syndrome, which um, I've had for a lot of the time of being in medicine. Um, and I think, I think parkour definitely taught me that you can do something that you identify with the requisite amount of work and kind of just focus. And there's a number of different examples in parkour and physical pursuits that proved that to me and so i definitely learned if you just do a bunch of work normally unless something tragic happens you can do the thing that you want to do and that applied to the scientific foundation that i had to get so i was studying biochemistry and loads of things that were way outside of my wheelhouse and i honestly didn't have a clue what any of it meant and i really struggled with it but i knew that if i just continued and i i just spent the time and so I, for the first kind of year I, I think I worked I worked much harder than probably most of my other peers to stay at the same level um so I was like frantically swimming underwater with my legs but it's meant that because I know that I can do that and um, I've been able to sort of catch up and 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 go in the direction that I want to go in and that 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 applied for the career choice I've made I'm an emergency medicine training and it's been fairly competitive recently um and to get into the program again i just thought right there's a bunch of boxes i need to tick uh, and i seem to be quite good at just if someone says these you need to do a b c and d i'm like yes sir just get my head down and do it and so for the training program to get onto that there were a few boxes i need to tick and i've just through parkour and probably some other things developed the ability to be able to just like kind of shut out everything else and just just do the work that I need to do to get to that point. Um, and the, the, I guess the second, the number two, um, the, the I think in parkour, I got confidence from that because I started to get competent within parkour. Um, with, in my own eyes, I got comfortable within different environments and things. And so I view in medicine overcoming to my initial imposter syndrome and that sort of thing. And building confidence, the the path towards that for me is just trying to get good at the thing, just competence. Yeah. And now that I'm, you know, I'm in my fifth year working as a doctor, I feel much more grounded. I feel, I feel pretty confident in scenarios that would have scared the hell out of me before. Um, and the only way that I can feel that is that I feel fairly competent in certain areas. I've got like a, a bit of evidence behind me that I can look back on and say. Oh, I've done that before. This is kind of similar. I should be okay. In a similar way to parkour. Oh, I've done a jump like this before. I reckon I might be able to do this. Therefore, I think it should be okay. So I think that that's a parallel that has definitely carried forwards at the moment. And it's something that I'm using pretty much daily. I'm working in intensive. Well, I've just finished six months in intensive care. And a lot of that was just dealing with patients that are, that have, you know, horrendously unwell and you're kind of going in situations thinking oh my god what do i do with this person but after building up enough 
experience that is similar and analogous. And, and then in my downtime, reading about it, putting the work in to understand the things that I've seen and just doing extra kind of developmental work around that, that gives me more confidence to go in. And I've, yeah, sort of carried those aspects of parkour into, into my career, I guess. Those are the main things, I think. Yeah, honest. it's like a, yeah. It's not the only background that could teach you that, but not at all. Yeah, utility to those hell nights that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you came into the hell nights of, of get the reps. First in. of all, figuring the stuff out, and then now having to deal with it in the day to day. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to run. I have a hard stop right at at uh, noon my time. So, of course, man. I really, really enjoyed this, Jen. Um, I hope we get to Likewise, man. another chat. Um, yeah, when we come over to the UK. Uh, normally I use this time to have people plug their online brands, but that's not you. But uh, is there anywhere people can find the old TCT footage? Oh, they want to see what I, we were talking about. I think, I don't think there is, you know, um, if you, there's an Owen video floating somewhere, Owen record of achievements, right. you search that on YouTube, you'll get some, you get some good old school TCT. TCT with Cambridge Tracers. Uh, yeah. Uh, hope to uh, speak again soon. Have a good day. You too, man. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Take care.